So you'll get a little message on your screen. And I will go ahead and welcome you all. My name is Sarah Lomaz Flesh. I'm the Executive Director of Shake Rag Alley Center for the Arts. And I'm pleased to welcome you all to the second reading in our 2022 Winter Writers Reading Series. Uh, and I mentioned the housekeeping notes and chat. So definitely, I do encourage you to use that chat. We'll have a couple of, of opportunities for question and answer tonight. And so I will be feeding Rick, passing on those, those questions. So definitely keep those coming. Before I turn the mic over tonight, I hope you'll indulge a few words about our organization. Since 2004, Shake Rag Alley, and we're in Mineral Point, Wisconsin, which is midway between Madison and Dubuque for the uninitiated. We're in what's called the Driftless area of Southwestern Wisconsin. <clears throat> and we were founded almost 18 years ago to provide arts and crafts workshops for adults and youth to cultivate the creativity that thrives in our rural region and to steward our campus in the historic heart of Mineral Point. And since 2011, we've had the privilege of partnering with Wisconsin Writing Contest organizers to offer week-long residencies to their writing contest winners. And this year, we're delighted to welcome winners from Wisconsin People and Ideas Magazine and the Wisconsin Writers Association, as well as Wisconsin's Poet Laureate next month. We're grateful to Rick and all of our writers for their willingness to share their work with the public or youth. In some cases, they go and speak to school children during their residencies. And we're grateful to all of you for being here tonight and to those of you who were kind enough to make a donation as you checked out if you registered on our website. Thank you so much. I wanna take a few more minutes to encourage you to visit our website to explore the creative writing workshops and programs we're offering this year. We have standalone, usually one day uh, workshops in <clears throat> subjects including pathways to publication, family history projects, writing from visual images, which will be a virtual offering, and a poetry workshop in the fall that's titled Gathering Gold, which I just love that title. In May, we'll be hosting our sixth annual Mining the Story Writing Retreat, which will feature workshops on memoir, fiction, and research and writing. And with the price of the retreat, all included includes craft talks, panel discussions, open mics. We're going to do a gallery crawl in Mineral Point this year. Um, and we have readings by faculty and local authors. We have, in addition, several free offerings every month. We have a Driftless Poets Workshop the second Saturday of the month, which is virtual and in person. And just last week, we kicked off a new free prose writing workshop. Um, that's meeting virtually until March, and then we look forward to welcoming everyone to our campus. And for the second year, we have our monthly anti-racism book club that meets the third Thursday of the month, also by Zoom. And this is to continue the crucial conversations that began in 2020 when we hosted an NEA Big Read of Claudia Rankin's Citizen and American Lyric. And this year we're reading one book every two months. And so we're midway through. Some of us are farther behind than others. That would be me. Um, the Hemingses of Monticello by Annette Gordon-Reed, which is just amazing. So to learn more about all of this and more, to stay up to date on everything that's going on here, you can sign up to get two newsletters a month by email. You can subscribe to our print catalog. I have a prop. This just came out, it's hitting mailboxes and we're very excited by the registrations that are coming in. Um, and you can follow us on social media, Facebook and Instagram primarily. Thank you for listening to that. And now I'm delighted to introduce Rick, whose short story, Tying the Knot with No End, written under the pseudonym Owen Abrick, was awarded the Wisconsin Writers Association 2021 Jade Ring for Fiction. In his political slash environmental life, Rick co-authored Walleye Warriors, the Chippewa Treaty Rights Story, which Rick was kind enough to donate to us for our library. Um, this was, it's now published by Beach River Books. 
Rick was the organizer for the Boat Landing Witness for Nonviolence and co-authored the Walleye Warriors book with the late Walt Brissett, Chippewa environmentalist and treaty rights activist. In that book, the chapters alternate between Walt's indigenous voice and Rick's white allies voice. And while the book mostly covers the years of violent protest against off-reservation Chippewa spearfishing 1988 to 92 and related issues, it's also a story of being native, capital N, to place and learning to be small n native to place. Walleye Warriors won the 1993 Council for Wisconsin Writers Book Length Nonfiction Award. Rick writes under the pseudonym Owen Abrick in part to quiet his politically correct mind so he can write fiction. His award-winning short story, which is on our website, um, you can read it in full, Tying the Knot with No End, um, is also available in the Wisconsin Writers Association book, 2021 Creative Wisconsin Anthology. At age 70, Owen had his first short story, Sewing Shop of Violet, published online with Story Quilt in January 2020. And Tying the Knot with No End is his first print publication in fiction. And again, a contest winner. I'm very impressed and inspired. <laughs> Rick grew up in Wausau, Wisconsin and met Ellen Smith, his wife, at Red Caboose Daycare in Madison. For the last 40 some years, they've lived in Milwaukee. Rick's first reading tonight is a story from another bioregion in Wisconsin. He'll read for about 20 minutes and then we'll take a break for question comments. And then Rick will read about 15 minutes from a short story in progress, which is about basketball in Milwaukee. And we'll have an opportunity for additional questions and comments. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rick to Shake Rag Alley in Mineral Point. Thank you, Sarah. I want to add to what she said that uh, I'm straight, cisgender, he, his, him, as they say nowadays, by temperament and a long career in daycare, now retired. Uh, I met the Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, uh, point on the dial. As a writer, I identify as Irish American and independent green living in the Milwaukee Three Rivers watershed. Uh, the fictional story I'm going to read uh, takes place in another Three Rivers region in southwest Wisconsin. It starts out in the 1990s, moving towards the cusp of the new century and onto the cusp of Google and social media. And then uh, by the end, it bumps into the third decade of the 2000s. Um, the story is written in the third person point of view uh, with the narrative camera mostly over Leo's shoulder. But the title is In Her Eyes, so bear with the irony. In Her Eyes. Leo scribbled in his notebook, his handwriting jumping with the easy bouncing of the riverboat. The young tour guide was standing at the front end, microphone in her hand, giving the tourists talk. Indigenous birds, bald eagles, herons, freshwater pelicans, and fishes, walleye, paddlefish, and catfish up to 70 pounds. And there were the invasives, purple loose strife choking the shoreline, zebra mussels on boat hulls, and the faucet snails that get, get stuck in coot throats, fatal to both. Leo could hardly keep up with the note taking. He preferred whole sentences. The guide, looking about grad student age, took a short break from her spiel as the paddle boat turned around and crew to take the cruise back upstream to La Crosse. He was traveling alone and self-conscious enough. He hadn't wanted to stare at turtles sitting on logs in the rivers, hardening their shells in the sun. Instead of complaining or panicking at the delay, as his first wife would always accuse him, he got up to walk around. Leo braved the moment and approached the guide at the railing. I hope you tell more of your river and animal stories. Soon, she said politely. I love that tribal quote, Leo continued, about the big storm never comes to a place where three rivers meet. I saw you taking notes in back, she pointed out. Embarrassed, he replies, he replied, I'm in bioregional literary criticism at the university. She looked a little dazed. Really, it's just stories of place. That's why I like this cruise so much. After the tour was done and all deboarded, 
Leo and Anita talked for a while underneath the straight, the tacky straight jacketed generic Indian statue that sentinel the river and the two exchanged contact information. Time passes a few years. So why did you pick me to talk with on that cruise? Anita asked Leo. They were cutting aster stalks in their front yard prairie garden with their daughter Keely. Uh-oh, he thought the bud is off the bloom. Maybe the age difference was finally hitting her. He was 10 years older, married for five years now. Not far away, Keely gathered coneflower seed heads. She was the five years. I needed someone to talk to, Leo answered. I was feeling anxious on a beautiful day on a calm river. You were the prettiest woman on board, he hastened to add, loud enough for Keeley to hear. In a whispered aside, Anita said, like one of your students? Leo had more of a say with his second wife. Though their age difference sometimes turned negotiations into tense arguments, he stayed even on the housework, never argued about music preferences, only the eurythmics in common, never played seriously competitive card games or board games. Leo never mentioned the radical 60s, which were really the 70s for his teen years. And he stayed away from argument's edge as much as possible so as not to appear controlling. Leo spent much of his time on his computer, though it clearly irritated Anita. His behind scheduled doctoral thesis was on Wisconsin stories in the land with a current environmental construct by a regional First Nations, the deep ecology reboot. He needed to make the third wave feminist happy so he didn't get trashed before he even reached all but dissertation. From the start, Leo enlisted his wife's, his wife's help in recounting her Scandinavian settler ancestor stories of place. And what would the damn title of it all be? Anita knew her great grandfather's winter stories. As kids, Grandpa Bob and his friends would be out on the big river in winter, pushing friends over the ice on a Model T chassis with a front seat and sometimes a cultivator seat put in too. It was worth whole afternoons. Different great grandmas had harrowing stories of unattended leg injuries. One fell, one caught a hot flat iron on her hip, but they lived too far from medical help, leaving both of them with respective limps. The great grandfather's happy memories, cutting Christmas trees, tapping maples, were tempered by the story of Trapper Joe Dale. A backwoods loner, Dale trapped for, fur, for furs and food along the river bottoms most of the year and frightened school kids who fished near his trap lines. Early one spring, teens found Joe's red cap stuck under the last of the ice out in McGilvery Bottoms and below the cap, the drowned trapper. No one doubted he had gone under checking his lines with one bad step on winter ice weakened by air bubbles from unseen quicksand below. On the way back to Madison one day, he and Anita stopped for a break. A few minutes down the road from a small town Walmart, there was a deserted undersized parking lot that she knew. Someone must have planted the surrounding prairie flowers. All together were purple cone flowers, rattlesnake master, goldenrod, and what looked like young asters a denser version of what would become their front yard. So native prairies could beckon native insects who in turn beckon native birds. The couple had unpacked, unpacked the blanket that day and the lunch they brought and walked up a small wooded path that soon hugged a slight creek. The stream's scanty rock outcroppings showcased baby waterfalls. At the top of the hill was a barbed wire fence and beyond Holstein cows. Sorry. Back off the hilltop, they found a cleared level space in the brush. No farmer in the dell, no farmer in the field. They were, here, they were within hearing distance of the parking lot if any newcomers should arrive. Together, they laid out a blanket and lunch. And when Leo sat down, Anita straddled him and began unbuttoning her blouse. When Leo looked up at her eyes, they were soft and confident. After later trysts, Anita would sometimes say again tenderly, what she had said that day, making love is healing the earth. Leo prayed he had never said that to anyone else before him. 
Through his daughter's daycare years, Leo struggled to extend his thesis, his master's thesis to the doctoral dissertation. Keeley showcased her mom's confidence when they all weeded their prairie garden. One was at Keeley school, and especially when Keeley played soccer. Leo started her on his borrowed animal legends around the campfire when they celebrated her kindergarten graduation. But, what, but would he have the time to finish his dissertation by co-parenting? And would he segue, and how would he segue into current and diverse stories of place? Leo pleaded with Anita, I need newer stories. The Hmong use Haas to shoots in their cooking. They haven't been here long enough to have land traditions. Well, they hunt and gather even ducks in the park. I need written down traditions. Leo had Jim's, Jim Stevens' seminal three volume set, The Journey Home, the literature of Wisconsin through four centuries, but he couldn't track down the eminent editor. Leo did know of Dennis Boyer's Wisconsin ghost tales and railroad stories, but he went to bars to get those stories, Leo said, and he knew how to get people talking. And I bet he didn't need to track down Indian elders and make them repeat stories three times. Time passes. Leo had gotten to a bad place trying to pin down academic things, but Anita seemed to be getting to a bad place with him too. If you're not making me fill in the blanks for you, then you're always trying to put a frame around what I say. Reflecting a little, Leo said, I guess maybe I'm going for the last word always, like my dad, the inveterate professor. Leo got the Van Heis home when his folks moved to Arizona. On a rare family hike in the woods at University Arboretum, Leo recalled the earlier time coming down the, the hill from the hidden dell. That's where Keeley was conceived, they always told each other. Now arguing had become mutual bickering as she added, everything's like it's a thesis with you and you have to win. And still, no title still done. Stories of place, everywhere now. Stories in the land, didn't Shaunakas and Irish, or maybe dwellers in the land, both taken. Wisconsin storyscapes, would that work? He could almost see the finish line, then Alita left and he was none too happy. Time passes briefly. Anita had decided to visit her old stomping grounds by Western Wisconsin's three rivers, just to get away for a while. As she was leaving, all he could muster was a lame, Okay, but how about some women's stories from your trip? Anita stayed at a B&B &B where she had gone as a child for birthday parties in the old mansion. It still had its third floor view of the river bluffs, though she couldn't afford that room. She wondered if wives over the decades used to watch the river for returning husbands. Boat captains like to tell the story of blue herons being the souls of drowned river pilots. The herons were always ahead on the river shores standing in the shallows, fishing, and warning pilots of hidden wing dams and buried logs off the old channels. But how did wives mark the loss of husbands? On her walk the next day, she visited Pro Street Books. She looked for romance novels, but took her time with the Wisconsin history books. Then she tried the new ice cream shop and walked over to Merrick Park, its critters and masonry cottage now a dimming fairy tale. On her first phone call home with Leo, he mostly worried about getting writing done, gaining permissions, and gathering more women's stories. Everything's coming apart, he moaned. Papers are strewn all over the place. You'll do fine. Keeley then got on the phone and reassured her mom. Things were good at home, but testy with her elementary school teacher. Anita listened for a while and then advised Keeley, don't show up your teacher, make your point with a question. On her next walk that week over the Petamone Bridge and onto Goose Island, Anita observed Hmong women bending over plants, maybe hosta shoots, and down a ways Hmong teens uh, smoking who knows what. Anita thought of returning home and what, what next task she might have any interest in. Just ahead on the island, cops showed up and most of the young teens scattered, easily outdistancing the police. One teen stayed behind to talk, to, to talk. But, became, but things became heated and, quick, and a quick-tempered cop threw the kid face first to the ground. Then two cops jerked the kid up and he started spitting out grass in their direction. The police threw him down, this time on his back and maneuvered some kind of rubber mask over his face. The teen squirmed and then slumped. Anita scared for the teen yelled, can he breathe? The cop shouted the young teen was formally arrested and with the spit mask thrown over him, 
put him limp into the cop car. Now Anita was pissed. Is he breathing? She screamed. The young women, the Hmong women had come over and were wailing. One was shouting at the arrested teen. Anita approached the women and gave one of them her contact information. On her next call home, Anita told him what happened on the island. And that, and that the next day a young man had appeared at the door of the B&B and gave her a thank you note in Hmong from the mother, along with a casserole dish of stir fried pork and an explanation of the rest of, the, of her note, the mom's note. I have to see this through, she told Leo, could be another week. I've got so much follow-up work to do. You're a good father, you can handle it. Keely needs her mom. I know what a mom feels like. Someday Keely will be out in the world and who will be looking out for her? Think of all the talks you have with her and all the errands you cover. You can cover the food and all those grocery stores you don't want me to go into with you because you've been flirting with the cute young checkout girls. Soon Leo read the lacrosse story in his afternoon newspaper. The cops claimed the Hmong teen had started, started spitting at them. So to protect, the, to protect themselves, they put a transport hood over his face. But in fact, it turned out to be some high-tech respirator hood you couldn't breathe out of unless properly hooked up to oxygen. The kid almost died. While Leo awaited Anita's return home, he wondered to himself how he could best credit Anita for all her contributions to her dissertation. And who might Keely give credit to when she was grown? Who in their family would end up with the best stories? The doctoral dissertation was eventually approved and a book version planned. Keeley was in middle school when his long delayed book finally found a publisher. That night, the night after Leo got the author's hardcover copy, he dreamt he was reading a paper by Keeley on her life up to that point, but he could not deci decipher it. When Leo's bioregional perspective in Wisconsin's environmental history was finally published, many prairie seasons later, only department professors came to the book party and students who were required. Leo and Anita's bright young girl went on to be a fierce college student, majoring in Southeast Asian languages and then became a translator, forgetting her dad's stories, but not the importance of stories. Time passes. Leo has come to wonder how Anita sees him, surly and graying. Sometimes it feels to him like they have everything in common and nothing to talk about. Now their daughter is her own woman, back in the States and teaching. Anita vacations every year, traveling with her friends to sacred sites in Southeast Asia. Leo is too old, ill to travel. Plus all those women, Anita wanted her separate time anyway. Today, Keely visits and tells her dad a story. Mom and, her, Mom and I were on Madeline Island, the Berry Island at one time. We went to talk to Sylvia Cloud. After the women's fire, mom and I went back down to the old mission cemetery by the landing, almost literally in the shadow of the yachts and tourist condos. The elder had said, grieving, that the Catholic church once sold off part of the old cemetery to the coming marina. But there were still these incredible little Ojibwe grave houses left, old wood with the wood sag roof sagging in for the way back ancestors. Lying in front were little offerings of tobacco, coins, recent food on plates. Leo knows about this trip, but he doesn't remember a graveyard story. Keely says, mom wanted us to look around, especially at the old family names on the tombstones that were in there also. Buffalo, Kadat, Warren, Brissett. After a few minutes inside the little cemetery, mom left looking pale. She walked over to a pond where the sun was setting behind the trees. I was fascinated by the gravestones, she had said, mom had said, and the little cottages with no... Keeley said, I was fascinated by the gravestones and the little cottages with no signage, so I stayed behind in the cemetery. Later, mom told me she, would, she had felt humming coming out of the old houses and the ground around the tombstones. It made her all shaky. All the spirits around, mom said, not my people, but trying to tell me something. Maybe get out, maybe come back and do things right. Oh my God, Leo says. Um, 
back one sentence. Maybe come back and do things right. I think mom was having a vision, like maybe the land was dreaming her or something. Oh my God, Leo thinks, my long lost title. The land is dreaming you. Two marriages, a career, a career while raising a daughter, old age creeping in, Leo's three rivers. Thank you, Rick. So we're gonna take a break for questions and, and comments. I, I don't see anything in the chat right now, so you guys can feel free to, to add anything in particular that you would like to pass on to Rick or, or ask. Um, I have some questions, Rick, if I could just, I always come at things from a craft perspective and it's so fascinating to me that you were primarily, and maybe I'm not, that's primarily is not a fair generalization, but a, a nonfiction writer. And so I wanted to ask about that timeline, that journey, that transition from nonfiction to fiction. Was there a hard stop? Is this something, had you, when did Owen um, <laughs> arrive on the scene? Can you tell us a bit about that process? Well, I think I've always wanted to write short stories and uh, quite a few of the short stories I'm lo looking at now have been in the drawer for 25 years wor and working on it on and off. So um, this is definitely bucket list stuff mm -hmm. with the COVID lur lurking. Um, and uh, so I just made the time to do it. And uh, I got with uh, Bright Oak Writing Studios in the Milwaukee area with Kim Soar and my friend Tom Malin, who's on the Zoom with us tonight too. So Tom and I trade critiques of each other's short stories. So that has really... Um, push me ahead. So last year I put out one of my first stories about the sewing shop in River West from the late 90s and uh, uh, that was lucky enough to get published online and then uh, really lucky to have uh, the Holy Hill story, Tying the Knot with No Wind, be published. So it's been interesting to learn the difference. Um, I, you know, as a political writer, uh, I'm reminded that uh, we always try and get the reader to reach an epiphany as we try and uh, give a call to action um, and, and uh, get people involved. If we don't change, if we don't get people involved, how will we do anything about the planet or our neighborhoods? But uh, the wonderful writer, fiction writer and teacher, Charles Baxter always said, uh, no epiphanies in short stories. So I guess I took that to mean no happy endings, but <laughs> mm -hmm. not always, maybe not always the case. So I'm still learning and I'm not one to give advice on fiction though. I'm glad, happy to give advice on politics. <laughs> well, well, Rick, uh, your reading was just amazingly uh, wonderful for me to hear you read it as not just on the paper because your, your emotion came out and the way you managed the reading was so special. Um, you have to do something with that Holy Hill book, first story though. <laughs> you said you would have it published? Well, Holy Hill is the tying the knot with no end story, so. Oh, that one, okay, all right. That, that is in um, the anthology too, so. Yeah. Uh, okay. So oh, that's, two, that's two, so. And this one, as you might know, is at Midwest Review, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I give my wife credit for taking out quite a few pages of my, uh, five pages of my writing darlings to make it fit in the 20 minute time frame for tonight. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a better version that will go out somewhere else soon. Uh, it'll, or back it'll, to Wisconsin wonderful. People and Ideas Contest, who knows? Right. Did you say that um, in her eyes, is it published in Midwest Review or you've oh, submitted it's under, consider it's under consideration. So. Well, great. That's so wonderful. This is also a work in progress, I think. So <laughs> we'll see. That is wonderful. Rick, do you find that your approach, like when you write, is it, are your habits the same? Like, are, are you a morning writer? I, I really drill down into these details because I'm always so impressed by those of you who publish, you actually get things out into the world. 
Um, so do you, can you tell us a bit about just on a daily basis, do you write every day? You know, do you have these habits and are you a longhand journal writer? Are you, what are you? Um, I might could give advice on how not to write. Um, okay, that works. I, uh, I don't have a regular time I write. Like most of the writers I do, I write uh, whenever I can. And some days it's, oh, I feel like fiction. Some days I better get back to the politics before it slips away. So I'm always jotting down things everywhere, like most writers do. And then when I have time, pull it all together. Um, so uh, what else do I do? I tend to choose place and then figure out character and plot character arc. I don't think that's what most writers do. <laughs> um, there are a few more things, but that, that's sort of as the spirits move me. But uh, this has been a wonderful month because I've looked at every one of my short stories just to get ready for this uh, week here at Tech Point and Mineral and uh, Tech Point and Mineral Point. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I see that Tajin has his. Yes, her hand I'm just up. going to ask. Go ahead with your question or comment. I feel like Tom and Shelly should how to pronounce my name. Y'all have known me for 20 years. My name is from. Um, also, I, always call, I always called you TJ. So, but I will. Um, so I, I have uh, two questions, um, and you might have already answered them. But I guess I'm more of um, looking at your why. You said that I guess like Owen Abrick is like your way to like express your nonfiction work, um, or no, your fiction work. And so I'm wondering, um, just like, uh, and you said it's like to kind of silent your political uh, mind. So like, what is like, what do you think about? Uh, I guess when you're writing politically versus. Uh, like uh, fiction and, and why, like, I guess, what is the why? Maybe you already covered that slightly, um, location, but I guess I'm just trying to figure out like your exigence and your conversations that you're trying to continue or create with these uh, books. And it could be just be like, oh, a cool story, but also, yeah. Um, well, one thing I would add is um, it's a way for me to claim my Irish American heritage with a name like Irish, um, Owen Abrick. And, other stories, well, particularly the Holy Hill story, tying the knot with no end is really um, clearly Irish American legacies and uh, the Irish tree alphabet is all over this short story, although not um, <laughs> expressed overtly. Um, so that's why I choose Owen Abrick. Um, I think if I can switch a moment to my political thinking, I think, um, one way to break apart whiteness and white bread culture and put a crack in the wall of white privilege is to ask or try and uh, push white Americans to recover their ethnic heritage, in which case they might revisit or learn their own stories of colonialism by the British and the stories of what brought them to this continent. And, um, you know, if they remember at least family stories, if not their language that their grandmothers prayed in, um, they might be open to hearing other people's, other cultures' stories. So if I had a didactic uh, purpose toward short stories, it would be that. But short stories are supposed to be emotionally honest, not. Necessary, necessarily politically correct, unless a fiction writer brings up those themes, then they better deal with them <laughs> in fiction as well as in their other life. I hope that answers it a little bit. <laughs> yes, it does. Thank you. And did anybody else have any questions or comments? And you all seem to know each other, so I will invite you to um, go ahead and unmute if you have a question or comment before Rick moves on to his next story. Uh, one more question, um, more about location and place. Um, I don't know if you would, I, there were a lot of good like descriptors in, in the story and, and it felt like, I don't know if it was based off like, like Wisconsin, but like uh, using even words like indigenous, you know, native to like that land. And it really seemed like whether it's like the birds or like uh, the plants or just like, the, like there was like a really like you could craft the the scene and it felt like there were things that even I didn't know 
like what they were like hmm, maybe i should look that up like or you know, it just really felt like i could imagine multiple different plants so i'm like i have no idea what's supposed to be here but it's supposed to be like beautiful and just like full of life and so um like like how do you do that do you like when you pick a place do you research all that or do you pull from like when you're when you're in these nonfiction ideas are you pulling from your own experience and where you've traveled and is that like your own reflection on life or like what do you do in order to like uh to like uh, well those are my uh from my notes and from my uh wonderful sister-in-law Gigi, Gigi Labuddy in Spring Green it was my mm -hmm. reference on all things prairie and forest so uh, it's, awesome. yeah I've been to these I've been to lacrosse sure and so has Ellen those people are from there moving on Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, I see we also have one person I don't know, so I'm very happy to see that. <laughs> um, and that would be, yes, Bill, who registered today. And there are a few people who registered and who I'm not seeing tonight. So sometimes life okay. interrupts yeah. the plans. So we're happy to see Bill. Hello. <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm read, also uh, an Irish American, so very happy to be here. <laughs> all right. I'm going to read from uh, Old Leather. I'm reading the second half of the short story. The first half takes place a uh, basketball game, but uh, the second half takes place at a tavern where the five of the guys go to decompress uh, and argue some more after the basketball game. Um, I'm going to do a few minutes on the setup, which, uh, which is what's in the first half of the story. So you understand the people that are referred to at the tavern. Uh, the basketball games happen every Friday afternoon <laughs> after a long work week. Um, Northside alternative school teachers in Milwaukee, all white guys, would get together and play with Latino agency guys from United Community Center on Milwaukee's South Side. They meet up at the old uh, Lapham School. Uh, it's an alternative, it's a rough enough alternative high school for kids having trouble uh, in Milwaukee public schools. Um, but the gym is named after Increase Lapham, the gentle surveyor of effigy mounds um, uh, in, in the Milwaukee area. So the main character is Peter, who's older than everybody else in the game. And uh, Peter fears he's aging out like the community gyms he plays in. His main rival is Quinn, who's a little younger than, every, than most of the guys there and much better than most of the guys there and the only non-teacher uh, in the game. Uh, minor characters from the game who also are referred to in the second half tavern scene are wasps, uh, wasp who stings like a solitary ground wasp, wasp with his hand slaps on defense. Uh, Chet, who's a great passer who mostly sets things up for Quinn shooting all the time. Ray spelled R-E-Y who's looking haggard and playing haggard that day because his wife has recently put him out. And Ty, who during the course of the games at Lapham runs the banana cut, a uh, curved route out of bounds and then back in to receive the pass. And that becomes important in the second part of the story. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Quinn's girlfriend also shows up to watch some of the games. She's in her uh, work uniform when she comes to watch Quinn play. And for the last game, a young African-American man uh, who nobody knows shows up. Uh, he looks like Michael Jordan and uh, can almost dunk the ball, uh, much to the jealousy of everyone else in the game. Um, the things between Peter and Quinn escalate to a pushing and shoving match uh, right in front of Quinn's girlfriend at the end of part one. So this is part two of um, old leather and Peter is on his way to Derry Haggerty Tavern. Peter's sister had all the sports trophies in the family. All he had were the injuries, crooked fingers from reach around poke away stingers on defense, arthritis starting in the ankles from pounding the boards and, and a torn bucket handle in his left knee, men knee meniscus. What pain would come from today's game? Peter wondered as he drove to the player's favorite watering hole, dreading taking the licks he knew he had coming. At the inner city neighborhood house gym where he used to play, the players were so good they could claim their own mistakes. My bad, 
or they'd settle disputes with, play the point again, or you, you can't call a foul and take the bucket. And dude, cut those fingernails. When Peter arrived at the tavern on Blue Mound Road for the usual after game post-mortem, Chet, Ray, and Ty, and Quinn were already there seated together by a window. Not many of the other players usually showed up. Wasp was rumored to have a family. The scene at the bar was always more verbal one-upmanship one upmanship and the steady throwing of barbs. The four hard drinkers had been decompressing. The play, players all added their funky sweat to the smell of peanuts and smoked ham. The redecorated Irish bar seemed cavernous with brightly colored alcoves of beer signs and posters. The same old brews in the straw colored cabinets, a few featured black glass decanters on small shelves and the stone hearth still unused. But Haggerty's old fishing village photos were gone as was the paddy wagon to baseball stadium sign, though some of the harp symbols remained. The old barkeep now rested across the street in the cemetery, keeping an eye on things. His protege carried on in his memories behind the bar. Like a sports hero's dad, uh, like a sports hero's, his dad just died, but he plays on. A young waitress arrived at their table to take their orders. What happened to the old Rose of Sharon? Ty asked. She retired, the waitress replied. You must be the new Rose of Sharon. Ty kept trying, always the player. What can I get you, fellow, fellas, retorted she, with hardly a smile on her tan freckled face. We have chicken soup and a pot of chili going. Everyone ordered his favorite cheap beer, Michelob or Miller's and appetizers. I'll be back, said the young waitress and took her leave. When she was just out of range, Ray said, another bad pass, Ty. Keep trying, Peter threw down, half-assed, trying to fit in. You should keep trying, Peter fired at him. You stunk up the place today, but for your lucky game winner, I have the touch, Peter bantered back. Ty's rebuttal, at least I know better than to diss a guy in front of his girlfriend. Ty wishes he had the touch, Chet said. The cagers continued with their rapid replays of games and more post-game dissections. Someone in the circle said, speaking of being in touch, Chet, did you invite the young kid who thinks he's there, Jordan? No, nope. he's a ball hog. Who the hell told him our, about our game? Blank looks around. He must have heard it somewhere. Is he a student at the school, Peter asked? He said he teaches there. Ouch. Not long, Ty, not for long, Ty said. I heard they're gonna access the Lapham building. Chet reported they're thinking of making it the gay safe high school. The drinks and appetizers arrived. Quadruple teamed, Peter took his medicine. Why do you always skip the first game? He has to save some for the misses. You can't lift a pint after two games. His wife's got him on a short leash. Don't laugh, said Ty. Some of us answer to her at work. Is that why they let me in the game, Peter wondered. I'm just trying to elevate my game, Peter defended himself. Your game is putting Quinn off his, somebody said. The drinking continued with more ranking on each other, more guys headed to the bathroom. Ty, after his bathroom timeout, took the curved route back, out of bounds, trying to get back into play, and stopped at the bar to get snacks from the waitress. No luck. He trailed her back to the table as she brought the next round of drinks. Quinn jumped in to thank the waitress before Ty could say anything. Then Quinn's girlfriend, Apron, came out from the grill in the kitchen and headed to the guy's table. Therese, Quinn greeted her affectionately. She bent over to whisper in his ear. His was the Mona Lisa smile. Then she said to the other guys, in college, I was a rugby player. Whenever we Whenever we creamed an opponent, we'd stand over him and scream, no babies. You nerds are nothing, the way you handle things. On her way back to the kitchen, she gave the young waitress a hang in there look like, we're gonna cut off their food and drink if they're not careful. The put down called for more drinking at the table. Would Quinn dare add anything to the dressing down Peter was expecting? Apologizing was like tanking in front of his friends. So Peter drifted away for a while. 
His high school coach, Coach A, always said, learn from your fuck ups. Get your head in the game or sit on the bench. When the mood seemed right, Peter showcased his favorite showdown story. He used to play in the hospital league. His team was had decent shooters, tenacious defense, like the downtown suits who played at the Jewish Community Center. But the hospital team was mostly male nurses, the closet jocks, with a few from administration. Peter continued, so this one time an argument breaks out under the boards. The whole game stops. Who elbowed who first? Would the ref even call a foul on a rebound? I'm not going to take no shit, warns the guy who crashed the boards. Then he reaches down into his shorts and a switchblade falls out onto the floor. Dude, Coach Lauer yells, this isn't the industrial league. The guy had come ready to fight, but he could have cut off his banana. Serious moaning followed and then subsided. Alan Bradley still has a gym up on their eighth floor, Quinn added, built in the 1940s for their workers. Then Quinn turned to the challenge at hand. You should really settle things better between friends. He was looking at Peter who ducked. Either Peter was aging out of friendship with his sports buddies or Quinn was right. Ray invited the gang to come down to the South side and play at United Community Center. It costs less than two beers to get in and the gym looks brand new since the do-over. I could use the company. Peter appreci appreciatively put the invitation into consideration, a game he could maybe handle. When he was a young kid, Peter would run out the back door of his house on a warm day and practice buzzer beaters in the driveway. Peter loved the touch, Peter loved the touch of the magic sphere, Spalding's pebbled leather ball, his dad's but meant for indoors. Peter could make his body glide in space flying towards the basket for a one-handed release, a shrimpy guy skying again for the rebound and the putback. When Peter finally beat his dad at basketball, his, fa his father growled and cursed at his own self for not being able to compute, compete anymore. Peter's relationship with Quinn was almost the same. I played a few times at UCC, said Ty. I heard a rumor, don't know if it's true, that Diaz once passed the ball. You have to pick him up at the half court line, Peter instructed, as if coaching now. Otherwise, he'll fire away and hit every time. By the third round of drinks, the bar had grown hazier. The Beatles were singing, come together on the jukebox. But the travel posters seemed to drift apart and sail away. Can I get you guys some food to hold you over? The waitress, the waitress was asking fish fry, grilled pork, the pub house double decker. Most had dinner scheduled at home. Three sheets to the wind, tie hit on the waitress again. Nice turquoise bracelet. Are you a jeweler? Leave the chica alone, Ty, said Ray, trying to get back in good grace with women. Ty for Tyler or the old Tyrone, mocked the waitress and departed. A chorus of ooh. There, fo there followed more analysis of good plays, bad plays, coulda, shouldas. Peter, barely holding down his beer, lost track of who was speaking in the huddle. Did you see my spin move along the baseline? Is that what shake and bake looks like in the post? You couldn't put the moves on a furniture truck. What coach is going to call out Jordan? He's not tra talking trash. Are we playing it at St. Cashmere's next Tuesday? It was the dimly lit gym a hundred years old in the old Polish church in River Rest that beckoned them. Christ, those guys wear pennies and practice their plays. Quinn, went, Quinn can run with them if he wants, Peter tried mending. But Peter had a feeling that something bad would happen if he went back to a game where he couldn't see himself playing at the level he knew the game deserved. What would the guys at neighbor house do when they couldn't make their bodies play the game the way, the, the way they know it should be played, he thought time for Peter to quit before he shattered his ankle trying to keep up with Quinn. Time to retire before he poked Quinn in the eye trying to block his shot. One evening, Peter allows himself three bottles of beer with dinner and later his best PM pain meds. He dreams Quinn's Therese 
is firing a rugby ball his, at his face from close range. He grabs it, but it turns into a soggy Nerf ball he's struggling to dribble up court against Quinn. Peter's only hope is to get the ball over to a teammate who can send a high floater towards, the, towards their orange-rimmed orange portal. Peter flashes to the hoop and skies above the basket to catch what is suddenly a frisbee shard of brown glass. Quinn has materialized right below him, so Peter has no safe place to land. In careful slow motion, Peter dunks two-handed the splintering gla glass and, in free fall, grabs hold of the swinging net. Savoring the showing out is all that matters. The glow from his show out dunk, his showtime dunk, lasts for days. Thank you, Rick. Sure. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I had a few questions for people to weigh in on or put in the That's chat right. room. That's right. One with, um, the title, uh, um, the working title for so long from so many drafts was Banana Cut. So if you like that better than Old Leather. Um, also, Jim Rats is under consideration or Holy Jim Rat, as if they, these were guys uh, in a Batman comic. So people can weigh in on that if they want to. Um, both stories that I read tonight are mostly in the past tense, though both of them at the end turn uh, are in present tense. So does that work or was it jarring when I read it that way? Um, yeah. Is it too layered uh, or is it too light or thin for a, for a lit magazine? So people are welcome to comment on any of that or add their own comments. I think that um, you've done a whole lot different from the ending that I ever read in our <laughs> drafts. And I do think, though, that you've made a lot of it's a lot better as a result. But I would hope you would take a, a look too at how you might tighten it for a shorter for a shorter story. Uh -huh. um, I think you have some opportunities in there, but I'm not sure where unless I read it again. So send it back to me if you want that whole whole thing, and I will be. <laughs> as you are always to me, <laughs> as Ellen. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I am so impressed though. Everything you've done, you, I, I, I really want you to have a collection of short stories uh, published at some point in your future. You, you deserve it. Thank you, Tom. And I will talk to you soon. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> And Rick, you have two votes for banana cuts. All right. Yeah, banana cuts. All right. <laughs> That's three. <laughs> Any I other? think it worked. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. I think that uh, um, going from um, past to present works, I think it also gave like an element of like comedic relief. And it was really like, um, I think there are a lot of descriptors in the past in the in the um past tense to really like uh place you in what you are and so i think that when it gets to pre to present tense it's like really nice and really assuring and the clarity is really there so i like it a lot thank you the um the first part of the story is fairly it's based on my experience playing in most of the gyms mentioned uh they're not alan bradley but i never went out to drink with the guys so the bar scene's completely fictional. So, <laughs> any other comments or questions? Michael and Gigi, welcome back, Gigi. <laughs> right, I have a niece who played rugby for Boston. Here we go. No worries. Okay. Um, I joined late, Rick. Um, I'm not a basketball player but I've seen Michael play adult basketball. Um, I would, uh, as a non-basketball player, I would vote for shortening it because there were some parts that really kicked and drew me in, but other parts, I just, it's not my vernacular. Um, <laughs> 
so it was hard to stick with it. Also, I have to say that the Zoom um, and Sarah, hi, Hello. you're there. <laughs> hi. Um, the Zoom venue is distracting to me because I wanted to read this story and I hope you'll send it to me because I haven't seen you for almost a year. So my, um, I was drawn to, this is Rick. Um, and so it-, it um, He looks so much younger than we remember him. <laughs> so the, the Zoom um, venue distracted me personally because I know you and I just wanted to to read the words or listen to the words. So I can't wait to get the story. Um, so that's, and I can't wait to see you. Yes, well, we'll see you in person tomorrow. That'll you will, nice. you will for the first time for a long time. You, you could watch the recording too, if you <laughs> want to. Well, there's a recording without your face. It's not that I don't love your face, but your face took precedent. So it was hard to follow the words of the story and I'm looking forward to reading it. Okay. Well, I, 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 won't read it. I won't read it over lunch tomorrow. So this is, this any, is any other show. comment? This is I um I got a little lost with the basketball as well. I, I tend to like to read things so I, I relate to your comments. Um I, I did want to just say I do think the bar scene works for someone who doesn't hang out in bars. <laughs> the groups after basketball seemed pretty good from my vantage point. I've been in a few, so I can't speak as a man, male basketball player in a bar, a bar yeah. but but I can't. Anyway, I thought it was I thought it was good. Um, I got a little lost, and I will say that I'm so lost with the basketball that the banana cut name I I don't have a, anything to say about a name but I'm like banana cut I don't know what that says to me but <laughs> thank you we'll take it up I'll take it up soon <laughs> other comments hmm. all right if we are nearing the end on this. I just want to thank Sarah for all she's done uh, and helped me with to get ready for this. Uh, a, a great thanks to Shake Rag Alley uh, writers, uh, Shake Rag Alley Center for the Arts and what they do for writers. And I think it's part of a larger network of writers in the triangle. Maybe Sarah will say something about that. And um, we, my wife and I have had a wonderful time uh, here at Tuck Point for five days. It's a great place. I don't know if you can see if I'm talking, if you can see the place very well, but it's it's a great writer's cottage. So any of you who want to come, we'll bring you back a brochure. So, uh, thank you again for coming on and listening to my stories. Thank you, Rick, so much. It's been so wonderful having you here. Congratulations again on your jade ring. And we want to thank the, the writers. Are you, yeah, look at there it is. <laughs> so fancy. <laughs> and thank you for bringing the crowd. You did this. And thanks to Bill for joining us too. Bill's a member of our Driftless Poets workshop. Okay. So it's I, we have that representation. And I should have made the Whaley Spring Green connection much sooner. <laughs> I, when you said you had family in Spring Green, I was thinking Ellen's family, but I've known Michael and Gigi since 2010, if you can believe it. So, I believe so it. nice to connect those dots. Lovely to see you guys. And uh, the Driftless is a famous bioregion, and not just in Wisconsin. So, right, right. Thank you all for joining in. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks you again. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>